I don't know if it pays nearly as big as it packs small. Mm -hmm. What's is up, it? everybody? What's up? Okay. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is Afternoon Astonishment. We're here with Conjurer Please Community, out, right? and yeah. I am Adam Grace. I'm here with Alex and Steve and Aaron. And today we are going to be looking at the infamous Dick Ryan. But before we do that, do us a favor, hit the like button or subscribe to Conjure Community on your favorite social media channel, and you'll be notified every time we go live with a new video. What's up, team? How are you guys doing? We are ready for Dick Ryan. We are ready to go to the trade show. What's the deal with Dick Ryan? Oh, <laughs> we're going to go there. Dick Ryan is a trade show magician. He's, he's passed now, but he was very famous in the magic world for working trade show circuit, where basically you're working for a corporation where they have, you know, a trade show is basically a gathering of like-minded uh, vendors that are trying to sell stuff in a certain kind of industry. Uh, for okay. instance, at a magic convention, that's a trade show for us, right? So if you imagine like the dealer's room of a, of a magic convention, that would be the setting that Dick Ryan would be working in, just not at a magic convention, right? But imagine that in a pharmaceutical for a pharmaceutical company or for an auto parts trade show, right? They would in this in this day and age before the internet was a way to really move a lot of product. It was a lot of personal sales, in-person sales. And guys like Dick Ryan were magicians that would basically attract attention, get people to come to a booth where someone is selling their wares. And then they could turn the reins over to the salesman that would then get the sales. But the magician's job was just to gather the crowd so that all the potential customers could then be sold to. And that was Dick's job. He would just go around the country and he would go to these trade shows and basically help. He was hired to help these guys basically just get more business. And uh, he made a really good living doing uh, this very thing. So today we're going to see some of the material that he used to do that job. And uh, it's interesting to look at it because a lot of it is standard magic that we all know, but he sort of has changed it to put this slant of promoting the company that he's working for. So it's interesting to see how these guys, you know, using Dick as the example of a beginning example of just how you can take a piece of magic and make it do something other than just mystify and entertain, but in, in addition to that, sell things to people and prime their minds to be buying things. It's just an interesting, interesting thing. So Let's look at this first clip of, uh, of Dick and we'll get a taste of that. This first one is him actually in the wild in the early 80s doing this, uh, this very thing for some, some folks. And uh, let's take it Early away. 80s, the heyday. Back in the day. The trade show golden age. It's like 40 years ago. In a very special way, the Eaton way, I'm going to pretend that you're bringing me a problem. Your Eaton representative, I have to solve the problem. Are you ready? Watch. What is the color of your card? This will be a black card. You see? What is the suit of your card? Spade or glove? Spade. This will be a spade. See? You're really exciting, huh? We get the answers <laughs> for you. We, we don't fool around. Maybe a little, but not a whole lot. That's why I say, sir, get to know us better. And, sir, the best way to get to know us better is to take an agent representative out to the network slayer. Think about it, sir. We don't work like everyone else. No. Okay. You said your car was a black card? You said it was a spade? Oh, this gets tough. Uh, <laughs> take the value of your card, double it. Whatever total that you reach, that card will match, and it will be a spade. Is that clear? In other words, if you get a five, you double it, this should be a ten, ten a spade. Now, sir, that'll give you an idea just how far we'll go at good old... Eaton Corporation to get you the right answer. <laughs> so if you're ready, Andy, the moment of truth, 10,000 tax-free dollars hanging the balance of what you tell me now, what should that card be? It should be the 14 of spades. <laughs> <laughs> Double the value, right? That's right. Yeah. Read it this way. <laughs> Wow. Did you think it was going to be a thing? You don't run into too many of those, sir. No. 
take one of those to Vegas and play 21 and see what happens. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, gang. I can tell that you're all excited and interested in finding about the 18-speed transmission over there. Check out the brake, brake analyzer over here. Find out about the 500,000-mile protection plan and truly know what is new for 1982 while you're here at the show, okay? Class is now officially dismissed. He Everyone is so good. He is so He's good. Selling it. Selling yeah. it, baby. Oh. That is so good. Just ringing every bit out of that you could get. That you know? different time. That was a different time right there. Maybe we're showing our age, right? But watching him do that, knowing what he was doing the whole dang time, you know, double your number, knowing where he's going, what he's doing. I just feel like, I mean, for starters, I just have to say, watching the whole setup, I remember being in Las Vegas in 1997. I remember going with Lee Asher to interop and and coming upon Bob Kohler's booth while he was doing the same kind of shtick and and just really notice noting noticing what a dork I must be, what a super magic geek, because I felt like I was at the Aerosmith concert or something. Like I was and I felt like I was in a time warp back there in a very good way. And then, uh, I don't know, I felt like the guy was mesmerized. Oh, yeah. He so, was totally, t I mean, that's like someone that loves that trick and can present it and really sell it like that. I mean, how can you not be enamored with that, right? I, I've, I've only seen, he's the second guy I've ever seen really do that trick in person. And the other guy I saw did it the same way, where he's selling it so hard, where, you're, you know, you think this guy failed and he's just like, I'm going to find a way out. I'm going to find a way out of this thing. And he's pausing. And you can see him just like, in the lights like what do i do now but you know he's got it it's really really good man because how can you see that ending coming i mean it's such a great gag and such a magical moment dude i, I love it do you guys think like kind of like like you said it's like going to see aerosmith i've always thought of the trade show what do you want to call them the trade show guys or whatever they're like rock stars it's like a different breed because you know if i go do a strolling gig you know maybe i'll do two hours three hours Hops. These guys will hawk it in that booth for eight hours on ten the whole time. You That's know? right. I mean, you know, we we should educate our audience a little bit about what this whole trade show thing was about. So I think we touched on it just a little bit. But so this was an entire uh, genre of magic that sort of appeared in the 1900s. Like I don't think it existed before. I mean, did it? Did it 1970s, exist? 1970s, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I said I the 1970s. 1900s, I said. Sorry. I meant um, the, this this generation. Like, it didn't exist in the 1800s, I no. think is what Okay, so okay. here's what I'm saying. Like, it was, it came out of left field. People started fi figuring out that you could use magic to get into a whole new source of gigs, right? Mm. Yeah. So is Eddie Tullock the first guy? He's one of the more famous ones. And at some point we'll bring it into here and we'll look at his magic as mm. well. So you can see, because really I was just, to me, this was like a natural progression out of bar yeah. magic. Bar magic seems like right out of that. If you're an entrepreneur and bartender, a trade show seems like the next logical step. If you're trying to grow out and not be in bars, right? It seems like the next place you would take that style of magic is a trade show, you know? Right. Although I tend to think, uh, and I mean this in a very wistful and positive way. I tend to feel like, these trade show guys are really very, very closely related to the venerable snake oil salesman. I, yeah, totally. I feel, agree. I feel like if you've ever done a, a real Spengali pitch or seen one, yeah. insert your product here. You know, he had this wonderful line in there, which I think is really indicative of the lesson. Uh, Stetson, John Stetson was one of my mentors and certainly in that area was, was my primary mentor. There was this bit he did where he forgot the name of the company. And if you didn't know better for a moment, you would actually think he's done this so many times, he might have for a moment forgotten the name of the company. Uh, but of course that's a bit. And, and what the idea of the bit is, is that while you are there doing the show and you are literally talking the name of the brand five, six, seven, eight times, you sort of have to have a wink for the audience. You have to be in on the joke you, yeah. you can't take it so seriously that people can't understand that it's all in good fun so while you're saying the name of the, the, the 
the company and you're doing the bit, there's a wink and a joke and it's all just a bit of fun. And because, you know, if you're stuck at the trade show all day, what, what could be better than hanging out and watching a great show? Uh, and so it's a way that you can really keep people connected to what's happening by not sort of taking it all too seriously while you're working. I'll tell you something else too. A lot of these trade show booths, everyone has a strategy, you know, to get people to the booth. And, you know, the really smart ones, in my opinion, use magic. <laughs> you know, that's, that's my opinion. But um, say that again, the really smart companies use a magician, use somebody instead of, you know, they, they use everything from giveaways, like keychains and junk like that to get you to come to a booth to supermodels, you know, uh, trapeze acts. I mean, I've seen all kinds oh, of stuff. sweepstakes and lotteries. Oh, and yeah, giveaways, also, dinner. I mean, they'll do anything to get you to stop by the booth. There's a whole continuum between essentially no brand integration at all, just literally getting people to walk by, then right. sort of doing what Dick Ryan was just doing here, right? Which is sort of some real, it, as we all know, it's, you say it's customized, but it's not terribly customized. It, it really you just mentioned the name. insert your right. company shtick in here and then you know uh people would start to specialize and they were starting to really uh grow in that market into more powerful types of integrations more uh customized types of integrations including the magic and, the and, stuff. and you know it was a uh, you could really become people could really shift themselves into being a uh, spokespeople and for a lot of these magicians that we would know uh, that would represent, a, you know, a way to sort of lever up in, in entertainment a little bit for people who are trying to increase their revenue. So a few years ago now, I, I don't know how many, but uh, I got a call from Danny Orleans, who is, does a lot of trade shows. And I did not know him. He just found me on Google and apparently his uh, sound system broke or something. And so he was super politely asking to borrow mine and i was like sure you know i've got something i can loan you and uh, don't everybody call me if you're in st louis you need a sound system okay um <laughs> but i said but i said uh you know the price is you got to let you got to get me a pass to come on the floor and watch your work you know and he did it and so just like you were just saying Aaron, it's like it's everywhere from you just do anything that's not even customized to like Danny was doing a whole thing on mobile oil where he was actually teaching features and benefits and he had cards and it was the magic, but it was a really heavy presentation on the features and benefits of that specific motor oil. And, and I was impressed at how heavy it was. And he just pumped that thing nine times a day, just like bang, bang, you know, gear, like doing it, crowd leaves, loading up, doing it again, crowd leaves, loading up, doing it again. It's hard work. Certainly. Very so, oh, I had, I did it. I did it for a little I've while. Yeah. Like I had, uh, I did one for, um, for e for the, what's the big giant video game conference that they have every year where they all yes. the, Cons hmm? yes, the consumer entertainment. Yeah. I don't know yeah. Yet. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and there was this there was this uh, new game that was launching from like uh, I think on PlayStation or something, and it was called uh, the game was 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 uh, what's this what's the movie? Say hello to my little friend, Scarface. 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 It, that was the game, and they laid on me the script. I had to read their script. Okay, mm -hmm. that script was like four pages long. It was so long, I had to end up using an ear prompter. I couldn't memorize it in like three days notice or whatever. But anyway, um, yes, they're just as important as the magic and all that is the important that they want their message gotten across and they want their leads. So it's a whole different kind of magic. So let's check out another clip. Let's check out uh, Dick Ryan doing it another way. This is... Incidentally, it was very surreal to tell everyone you wanted to be a professional magician, make a living, and have everyone tell you this is what you have to do. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. And not altogether a welcome piece of news. Mm -hmm. That's hard work. This is going to be a little bit different, but again, it's a way of getting a commercial message into the routine. You can see that all the cards in this trick deck are all different, right? <laughs> yeah. 
Oh, I'm sorry, I forgot the numbers. <laughs> there they are. Jim, do me a huge favor. Okay. Look at a card. Don't take one, just look at one. Uh, you got one? Got one. Good. What card did you see? Ace of spades. No. No? There's no ace of spades in the deck. Are, are you sure? Well, you take the deck in your own little hand. If there's an ace of spades in there, you take it out. A lot of people, Jim, say they see things in my deck that's not there. Well, Jim, these people have problems. Well, Jim, when you have a problem and you want to get the right answer and it pertains to printing and so forth, you always want to look to your representative in Arcata because oh. these guys have the answers for you. <laughs> yeah. that make you feel dumb? Yeah, it does. Yeah. I think, oh, I feel like i got to wear the dang thing. But, Jim, let's start from the beginning. Maybe you'll understand this a little bit better. I'll slow down. Why don't you just start from the beginning, reach in here, and just take another one. Just anyone looks good to you. And then let the gang see that you've had a free choice. Now, we're all set. And it, it's Something wrong, Jim? No, uh, no. You didn't get the same card. One did. track mine. So. I don't understand that. Look, I'll tell you what, let's do. Would you hold on to it for just a second, sir? Thank you. Jim, uh, try it one more time. Just anyone looks good to you. Just take any up. one that you want. And again, let the gang see you've had a free choice. Now, we're all set. And it, something wrong? <laughs> yeah. I don't understand that. You, you keep taking the same dumb card all the time. I thought I gave it to you to hold on to. Check it. I didn't give it to you today. <laughs> You do something funny? What? I don't have it here either. Now we're in real trouble. Now look, instead of you taking a card, why don't I just give you one? That'll straighten you out, okay? Now look, there is the five of heart. Now you hold on that five of heart and don't let it get away. Now you definitely got the five and we're all set to go, right? No. Hmm? No. No. <laughs> Jim, do you know what's happening? No, I don't. Jim, you're beginning to see that at Arcata, when we make you a statement, We'll stand behind it all the way. We have consistency in what we say and do. And this is our trick. Deck and I are putting you on. <laughs> so you take the deck in your own little hand, take all those ace of spades out of there, and I'll do something different. Yeah. All the aces. Yeah, they, they look like this, Jim. <clears throat> There's not Jim, one in here, right? That, yeah, that, that trick's all over. <laughs> yeah. <what> okay. <laughs> Just thought you'd like to know. Uh, great. <laughs> Pretty great. Holy smokes, dude. I have to say, I have never seen a top change move that fast in my life. That was a top change. Now, I his look, man, his classic force is what I would call old school. Well, I might even say, what's the word we use, Aaron, sometimes? Or what? Showman? Old timey? What are you talking about? Yeah, you, you, you know, when you when you sort of uh, 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 you figure it out as you go. We have a word for it. Uh, ham dog. Yeah. That, that, uh, that, that, that classic force was like a half ham dog, you know? It was awesome, though. Well, when I you're moving it, at that pace, that's part of the deal. And I think it's an old school way. I mean, he's, he's a guy who's definitely using a lot of Hindu shuffles and he's just using that Hindu start action to get into getting the break, right? So that's, that could look a little ham doggy, but I think that was just his way of getting a break before he did the classic force and probably learned it from some guy when he was a kid that that was the way you do it, right? And I would imagine that Hindu shuffling was just a, much more prevalent. And I think modern magicians have sort of thinned it out. And there's not as much Hindu shuffles and card magic as there was, you know, 100 years ago because we have better methods now. Again, it's like one family relation away from a circus pitch tent. No it's doubt. It's very, very, and you know, it's the same thing. And the guys that are really good at this are good, are people, people. They're good at choosing, and they're just a uh, showman, frankly. Uh, and you know, one other thing to notice and about salesmen that, and salesmen, <laughs> um, You're like natural born salesmen. But at the end of the day, I one of the things I really came to feel learning this is that you know that's magic. I mean, you, you sort of have to sell magic in order to put magic over in the first place. Mm -hmm. So it's a very similar kind of energy already. And so it makes a lot of sense. It's just interesting that he's really what, what we're seeing is this beautiful sort of tabletop trade show uh, act. And like Alex says, it is a lot like bar magic in terms of its general layout, um, if, not, if not the pacing and the timing, but uh, which is different. And it's a whole other thing is when, you know, like Adam, when you said you had that show to do, were you on stage with a microphone or were you working tabletop like uh, Dick Ryan? Microphone. All right. And so that's like more like a presentation with a microphone up in front of maybe 20, 30, 40 or more people. Right? Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. I always found that uh, the exact kind of space that uh, Dick Ryan is working is uh, is very comfortable. You know, you're down there in the in the trenches with the people, as opposed yeah. to elevated. Elevated yeah. feels like a stage, even if it's only a foot off the ground. You're on a stage. Well, so well, Steve, when you work trade shows, didn't you find that often you didn't f- know what space you had till you got there? I mean, they. I mean, yeah, you don't you don't know anything. It depends on if you're doing a one off for a company. Yeah, you have no idea. Just show up at this time, be ready to go, you know? Yeah, and sometimes they, it's busy and sometimes it's not. Yeah, and sometimes yeah. it's busy and sometimes it's not. Uh, they may have a really beautiful booth. Like they might have purchased the deluxe booth in a perfect, really high yeah. traffic spot. Or you may be at a single table with four salesmen and you've got one little tiny piece of that table to work off of. Yeah. Well, Dick knows that. That's why he's doing, you know, yeah. or that's Actually, why he's using one deck. And, and, I think, are all and, I think, and I think Dick's bringing gear too, right? He's got like in the car, he's got another table. He has a table. If they don't have the yeah. table for him, I think he's got the gear he needs. I know? think what a lot of these guys do too is they have a couple of these tables that these kind of pop up and they just ship them around with the boot. So it, it's just there and they just pull it out of the back and set it up and do their thing. And then wherever the booth goes, that's where that goes. George. I guess that's if you're working for the same company. Over oh, there. can you imagine if we'd only had it in stands back in the day? With- I know. It's funny you mentioned that. I was just going to say it. I've worked a couple trade shows when I first got into, you know, being a professional and working for money. And I built what was in essence an in stand. And it was pipes that you get from like Home Depot that screw together with like a flange. And I like drilled that into a big piece of wood that I put a close up mat on and like coated the whole thing in felt. So that I have this table that collapsed down to nothing and I could screw it together and put it into the booth. And, you know, it was that one little extra touch that made me look a little bit more professional. Brought my own table, you know, in the 90s. It was pretty good. <laughs> in the 90s. <laughs> uh, you something, George, you say, what about the visual van fan force? That was not what that was. It looked like it, but it wasn't. That right there, my friends, was this coming back and estimating just about where he thinks they looked. Then he asked, what did you see? He looks down, he gets his position, moves it to the right place. It just happened to be the ace of spades. We got lucky that it was ace of spades, so it looked yep. like it was a horse. That's right. <laughs> yep. That, if you go back and look at the David Bergless afternoon astonishments that we did, where he's doing a lot of that you know, named card stuff, that what Adam just said, you can see more examples of that. Because this one... Dick was so smooth that you could barely even tell he cut those cards, right? It just happened so quick. It was just over. But with Burglist, you might get a little bit more of a clue. And if you have that Burglist book, then you probably know all about it. That's uh, that's where you can learn that technique in depth, uh, where he's just basically showing a fan. And if you notice the fan that he did, it was a reverse fan so that you could show more of those faces a lot like David Burglist. So uh, there it is, if you're interested. There may, be, there may be like a little something to it. Like, I don't know Dick's technique and I haven't read the burglist technique, but if I were to do that to you, do you see the eight of spades oh, more yeah. prominently? Sure. Sure. So maybe there is, you know, some techniques to which he could have tried to force that ace of spades. But to me, it looked like he did exactly what he did and he did it well. Mm-hmm. And remember how he got into it, right? He did that reverse fan. So it was a blank deck and then he made a gag about, oh, I got to have, I got to make the faces. And he did the faces and then he went reverse, right? And that that's the fan, right? It's that, it's that burglist technique. Because if you don't have that giant fan, if you're doing a regular fan, a regular pressure fan, the indexes are too close together. And you don't show all the cards. And with that bigger fan like Burglist makes, it's the way you can actually see what's going on and have a feel and actually get in there and cut and get the thing. Again, if you're interested in that kind of work, the Burglist book is really the Bible on all that stuff. I would check that out. The Burglist effects book that Richard Kaufman put out. Uh, They're a little bit tougher to get now, but if you want to know how to do that stuff, that is like a Bible with like step-by-step instructions on how to really do it and uh, many examples on how to do it. Uh, So there it is. I'll leave it there. Mm -hmm. And then we won't even talk about that top change because that top change was fierce, bro. Fierce. Just postgraduate work in that. Just watch them do it over and over again. Yeah, really. <laughs> you know, when I watch this, Aaron, you know, when I watch footage like this, I think about that saying about like, uh, well, you don't know what you don't know. Like when you get into magic, you think it's, it's oversimplified, right? Because you're a beginner. And so it seems very simple to you. A few gaps, a few things. But the more you learn about magic, your understanding, like, 
like the the curve goes down like the further you go in magic the more you realize you don't know until you've been in it long enough for the curve to start to go back up right and so a lot of what you're watching that guy do right Aaron I mean he he it looks simple but it's not and, and in a way it is I mean it's a it yeah I mean I don't it's really interesting you know I see that Newell just mentioned uh, the Dingle book and I sort of remember being 15 and have someone do essentially that same method on me at the Maryland Renaissance Festival and being kind of astonished that you could have someone look at a fan of cards and that you could nail it like that and then telling me to go find that book and then finding that book and just sort of being mystified at these effects that feel where the methods feel like magic and then sort of reading the stuff that Alex is talking about in that Berkeley's book and then you know returning to that same thing which as far as I know, he was more or less doing what was in that Dingle book, more or less. And, and it's the same and it's different and there's endless nuance in it and all that nuance can just mess you up. So it's like, you know. Yeah. You know, well, the but problem, the problem like is, time, you know? the problem is, is like with the Dingle book, you get like a few sentences where he says, do this, do this, do this. And you have no examples. I mean, I think that's one of the powers of CC, right? When we're hanging out and we're able to do things like this afternoon astonishment, and we can just see examples of people doing this stuff. I think that's when the curve starts to go back up, right? You can learn techniques till you're blue in the face, but until you see them in actual practice and in the hands of an actual practitioner, it's going to be mystifying. You're not going to really get the whole gist of it until you're really seeing it in action and fooling people and in person even better. But being able to see video like this so that we can actually see these guys do this. And it's one of the reasons why it's fun to watch all these different genres because there's only so many effects in magic and we're crossing over many different effects over and over again that are just the popular effects but to be able to see them presented in these different lights by different people to me that's that's where the real education is right that's where you really see how these things it's that phrase where the rubber meets the road right mm -hmm. it's that we're able to see that in action with these guys really doing this stuff you know what else too when you look at at uh dick ryan it's like you're looking at a guy he's got thousands of reps on that you know in front of real people under fire and it's it's beyond technique at this point right it's mm -hmm. like he's into it so hard that he's, he's into it so hard that he could notice a coincidence and he could yes. actually exploit a coincidence rather exactly than having to focus on a technique and whether or not that force hits couldn't matter less yeah he's got 27 other ways to go you know? he's it's just he just keeps trucking I love Ex to see that. Exploit a coincidence. Yeah. That is a really great. Did you make that up? No, because that's when real magic starts to happen when you're performing, when like things happen that like shouldn't happen. They say a card that if it's that, it's going to be a miracle. And if you're not on your thinking on your feet and you're not completely present with the piece of material that you're working, you don't have room in your mind to be able to execute a technique to take advantage of a moment like that. I've had enough of them come up that I realize what the level of practice is for routines when you're really doing them for people because you want to be present enough so that you can recognize things like that and exploit it and make, you know, jack it up as close to a miracle as you can get. And I mean, we're miracle workers as far as they're concerned, right? So how close can we get to that miracle? I'm always on the lookout for that. And that's, it's that. It's just perceiving a coincidence when it's happening in the moment, right? But when they happen and you hit those, they, you know, it's not, you're not a magician anymore. You're something else. And they start to tell you about it. And that's, you know, if you can start to touch that spot, I think magic just becomes more fun and you're just blurring the lines of reality. And, you know, you're making people really feel like the world is more mysterious than it is. And, you know, as a magician, I want to reach that spot every single time. So as much as I can do to do that, I'm, I'm all over it. And that's, that's it. It's just being present with your material and knowing it well enough that you can like pause for a moment if you have to and take advantage of something, right? Yeah, I kind of feel like that's where David Blaine lives. Go ahead, Aaron. Sorry. Well, I was going to say, the more you do magic, you'd be surprised how often. I mean, you're getting lucky every day. You're getting lucky every hour. You know, if you're doing a lot of magic, uh, yeah. every time every time you pick up a card, there's an opportunity for a So, you know, like one in 52 the, comes up at least once an hour. You know, <laughs> Like some of the stuff you've you've been showing in the last year Aaron like that you showed to a couple of my friends like <laughs> some of that stuff messed them up so much and you know it, it all it all felt like exploitation of coincidence I, although it wasn't that wasn't the techniques you were using but it 
the the miracle level of that stuff felt like that you know i feel like in order you have to have your magic totally worked out in order for those coincidences to help you otherwise you're waiting for your ticket to come in and it's not going to come in like if you're if you're if your plan is to amaze the people with coincidence you're going to find coincidentally that coincidence is not forthcoming today it's sort of like uh you know that old line about whatever it is helps those who prepare you know what i mean those who help themselves that kind of thing so if you've got an ending that's great it's like that whole it's like that pop hayden chicago surprise right when you have an ending you start hitting classic forces because you don't need them it's a lot like that definition of luck right it's where hard work and preparation meet <laughs> yeah. it looks like luck to the uninitiated like when you're doing that if you're doing the classic force it's a perfect example you're doing a classic force and you simply when you well, i remember being 15 trying to learn the classic force and that being the big ending because you classic force it and then you do the ending and i couldn't hit it to save my life and it would look desperate and terrible and sad well as soon as you've got the ending worked out and the classic force is the least interesting thing that could happen to you. It's amazing. All the pressure leaves, people start taking the card mm -hmm. relentlessly. And the more you start thinking that you'd like to have the other ending, the more they start taking the <laughs> classic force card. Yeah. You know? And so You're that's right. the best way to start hitting it is to set things up so you don't want them to. That's, that's really good advice. You're right. You're exactly right. And that's what happened to your friend. Yeah. So, would you guys rather watch the Lincoln Rings or the Spike Coin? For, we got we have time for one more segment. Or uh, if we're going to do one more, just do the 52 on one because that's a really great example of putting that thing into the real world with a, a real method that I think is a fooler. Bingo, bingo. bingo. Here we go. All right. You see it? Yep. Got it. Hey, no Good respect. to see you again. Haven't seen you for about, what, three minutes, <laughs> right? <laughs> Tony, this is kind of interesting. With a deck of cards? Yeah. And what I'm going to do is to take out a card like that. I'm going to put it down ahead of time. But now, Tony, if you were to look through a deck of cards and one card were to stand out in your mind more than any of the rest, what would that card be? Don't say the ace of spades because everyone says ace of spades. Uh, yeah. Three of hearts. Now, that's interesting that you'd say that. Isn't that interesting? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, you know, when you run through here, there's no three of heart there. Not at all. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. <laughs> Would you believe I got the three of heart there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I do. Because, you see, when I work trade shows and things like that, and I make statements, I got to stand behind it all the way, just like a company. You know, when you're involved in a trade show and they make a statement about their products or their services, they got to stand behind it. And I'll stand behind what I say. The three of heart is there. Yeah. In fact... I won't even touch it. You may turn it over. Yeah, go ahead. Do I lie? <laughs> yeah. See, I, I, put the, I, put the, I put the whole deck of the one card, you see. It makes you think that. But you see, <clears throat> when you're working with a big company like I'm working for today, you know, you've got to have the right answers. You've got to make everything crystal clear to everyone. Do you understand now, Tony? No, no, no. Good. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> There you go. That's the finish for that trick. <laughs> Top change, man. What about it? I mean, there's this wonderful, so there's a wonderful, uh, there's the wonderful conflict there, right? Is that, I mean, this is at the heart of all trade show kind of old school trade show magic, right? Is you were sitting there pulling people's leg, fooling them, ostensibly fooling them, lying to them, ribbing them, fooling them. It's fun to be fooled. It's literally you're fooling people. You're saying one thing, you're doing another. Ha ha, you're wrong. That's amazing. And the whole time he's talking about the companies I work for tell you the truth. We never lie. We don't cheat. We say what we mean. Hide your face. It's really here. No, it's not. Ha ha. But that's what integrity is all about. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and. And as soon as you like, I think, get the idea that that's, that's the act, that's the shtick. Otherwise you can have a hard time figuring out how to play that. You start going in there speaking for the company and you're 
trying to be forthright and true and it's at cross purposes with card under glass it just is yeah like this like aaron <laughs> you you have a free choice right you know at humana insurance we want you to have a free choice about your health and your future i right. think i've got the hang of it so it's like bait and switch because that's what we would never do to you. Now you take it. Yeah, that's right. Fooled again. Fooled again. But if you don't want to be fooled again, try integrity. <laughs> try integrity. <laughs> I can try integrity. 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 You know, I mean, but that's what it is. So as long as you, as long as you know, it's kind of silly. And the funny thing about it is the company doesn't mind because. It is kind of silly. What I always found was kind of a little harder for me, and you guys have listed some cats right here, is folks that don't see the humor. Mm. But that's a different kind of company, different kind of story. But then you sort of just wonder, in my mind, you're like, how on earth did this, you know, which marketing guy in this company says, you know, that's the guy with the attitude to put over this beautiful sham. <laughs> you know this guy is planted straight like when the when the median mortuary company calls you to work their trade show booth and you're like all right everybody have you planned for your uh oh my god you i don't this know pack of brand new stiff cards stiff, <laughs> stiff, stiff. so using a casket as a performing surface light as a <laughs> light as a feather stiff as a board I, I once what do you did, people uh, got rigor mortis? Hey. I once did a gig <laughs> for, for the Missouri Monument Association. I had no idea. I didn't know. <laughs> How'd that go? <laughs> I was I was doing my opening, and some guy walked up with a tape measure and measured me. Like just as I was speaking to the room, he just walked up and measured me because they make coffins. That's <laughs> company makes coffins. That's so he comes yeah. up and measures me. It's like you're gonna die here today, he says. He goes back and he <laughs> Cas caskets. Cas did I say coffin? You did. Cas and we were recently educated by a friend that you know, if you're in the Unforgiven and they're gonna set you upright like Dracula, and you know, if you're in the Wild West, are you serious? You know, in a box this shape, you know, like a bubble gum. You know, to say this, Steve knows this. Coffin cases, dude. You've seen them. That's guitar cases, absolutely. they're shaped like a coffin, <laughs> but a casket. <laughs> casket. The that actual integrity. I killed at the casket show. The actual definition is that a, a coffin has five sides, okay. and, and and a casket. One. Has... <laughs> right. Ooh. Ooh. Well, wouldn't it be? <laughs> wouldn't it technically <laughs> be ten sides? No, it's not. Lid, right? It's one, uh, two, three, four, five, and six sides. Well, I think if we're talking about two-dimensional space. I'm just trying to say, if you're picturing yourself <laughs> in the Magnificent Seven and you're in Deadwood Gulch and someone had to build you one real quick for everlasting slumber, that's likely a cough. Made out of slats. However, if you're in Wallachia, in a beautiful, beautiful resting place, steel cask is likely a casket. Well, what are caskets made out of? Is that like a plastic thing that they like die injection mold? Wow. Or vacuum thing? I know the answer to this. What Jews is it? Don't use plastic caskets. So no, caskets are made of either wood or metal in the majority of the time. How do they shape them like that? How do they get that nice curvature on them? Uh, oh, sure. oh, well, they're they're just like they would upholstery or furniture or anything. It's it's oh, okay. but metal caskets uh, typically are not as curved but but if they did it it would be like the bumper of your car or something so, so it's like a metal frame that's covered with like sheet metal then you're saying yes so, uh, got it okay thank you everyone for joining us today on <laughs> <laughs> tangent that old, so that old old tangent. barcelona not to take those arbor day shows absolutely without a little prep time that that to learn that'll learn you well, you know, we're still learning ourselves about these here afternoon astonishments, but we do want to thank you. We do want to thank you for joining us today, everybody. Uh, listen, if you had a good time, you enjoyed it. Why don't you hit the like button that tells this here social network that we're doing a good job. While you're at it, go ahead and subscribe to Conjure Community. You'll be notified when we go live with new magic videos. For you Conjure Community members, we'll see you tomorrow night at our show. 
the rest of you guys. We'll see you on Thursday afternoon for the next afternoon astonishment. Sorry, I had coffee. <laughs> bye bye.